Hello, my name is Heather Tillwine. I'm an assistant professor at Austin P State University, and here is my presentation on silencing the rainbow, the prevalence of LGBTQ plus students who do not report sexual violence. And here's all the authors that collaborated on this project. So a little bit of background about this topic on sexual violence amongst the LGBTQ community. Um, it does not get a lot of attention compared to our cis heterosexual students um, in the United States. Our current data shows that as high as 90% of students are victims of sexual assault do not report it. Um, and we know there's various reasons of why that occurs. 9% believe that um, they would be believed if they reported it and that support services could not do anything if it was even reported. Um, there's even a few reports out there that say that LGBTQ plus students are even less likely to report sexual violence than heterosexual students. Um, and then there's even more due to the fear of a perpetrator. So we still have these power differences and these heteronormative norms a masculinity that can influence whether a s individual that is on the LGBTQ plus continuum um, wants to report or not. We do have existing programs and services, but they're mainly designed for cisnormative or heteronormative um, perspective um, on this. So a lot, not a lot of focus on LGBTQ individuals that have been sexually assaulted, especially when it comes to students and sexual assault. Um, there's a lot of mistrust and decreased helping on LGBTQ plus sexual violence victims. And so the purpose of our study was to look at different types of sexual violence and determine what types of violence are not being reported. Um, of course, these are all individuals or participants that are LGBTQ plus and secondary students or post-secondary students as well. So our methods was it was a quantitative descriptive cohort study. So everyone that um, participated in the Point Foundation Health Study or Survey was a part of this. They all identify as LGBTQ+. Um, and so here's our demographic breakdown on gender identity. We did have an instrument that we used, um, and this is our 2019 data set, and we had about 808 participants for this. And we looked at various types of sexual violence that occurred during the reporting year of 2019 academic year. Um, and like I said, these all came from the Point Foundation scholarship applicants, and they were sent the survey. And we did have various individuals from community college, vocational school, four-year college, and graduate school for this. Here's some more background about our sexual orientation and age. So obviously, a lot of our participants were between 18 and 30 years old, because that's the majority of individuals are in the college environment. Um, the majority of our individuals were gay bisexual and queer. So we did have a very diverse background when it came to sexual orientation. And for our racial background, we have a lot that are Black, African-American, Chicano, Hispanic, and Latino, and of course, a huge population of white and Caucasian. Um, for our gender identity, just to backtrack a little bit, we do have the majority of ours, like 58.91% did not um, identify with any of these gender identities. Um, and then our second prevalent would be our other. So we have do not um, adhere to these terms and also they identify as other. We have gender queer, which we had a ton of, and gender non-conforming. Transgender men, we had 74. So we did have a big diverse population when it came to gender identity and sexual orientation. So for our analysis, these were the questions that we looked at um, when we analyzed the data. So obviously the questions that they were asked is if anyone made sexual remarks or told jokes or offensive stories to them, made inappropriate or offensive comments about them or their body, someone else's body or any sexual activities, um, said crude or gross sexual things to you or tried to get you to talk about sexual matters, um, email, texted, tweeted, phone, instant message offenses, sexual remarks, jokes, stories, continue to ask you to go out to dinner when you explicitly said no or they asked you continuously to have drinks, have sex, and you kept saying no. Um, if you were just sexually assaulted, so this included unwanted touching, forced or pressured into having sex. Um, and then their options for why they didn't report was embarrassed or ashamed, did not think anyone would take action, thought they would get in trouble, did not want to get the other person in trouble. So all this data was collected from the Access to Higher Education Survey instrument. Um, we measured it before COVID. 
So that was kind of important because COVID really sparked in 2020 and everyone moved online. So we took the data set before that. Um, we used the Pearson Sky Square to determine whether it was statistically significant differences between those who experienced different categories of sexual violence and those who did not actually report the violence. And so here are our results. So there was a significant relationship um, when we did our correlation that showed those who had these crude gross sexual things or, um, or talk to them in sexual matters and those who did not report the type of violence. So it was statistically significant. And so with the breakdown of that, those who were 92.2% um, of them that had experienced this type of violence did not report it. So out of that whole population of those that reported it, 77 of them, which was 92.2%, did not report that type of sexual violence. When it came to email, tweeted, phones, um, instant message on offensive sexual remarks, jokes, stories, pictures, and videos um, that they didn't want. It was statistically significant. About 87.2% of the people that had that experience happen to them did not report it at all. And then to continue on, those that made sexual remarks, jokes, or stories that were insulting or offensive was statistically significant. Um, and out of those, 90.5% people that experienced it did not report the assault. When it came to those that were continuing to ask drinks, dinner, have sex with, even though they said no and it was continued, um, that was statistically significant. And out of those 91.4% of those individuals that experienced it did not report this type of sexual violence. There was also another significant relationship with those that were sexually assaulted and not reporting. So out of those that were actually sexually assaulted, 87.5% did not um, report the violence. When it came, there was no significant relationship when it came to making inappropriate or offensive comments about someone's body um, with that 91.9% of people that experienced did not report though when the analysis came up. So even though it showed it was statistically not significant, um, out of the whole population, 919 did not report it on um, that experience this particular type of incident. So it's kind of um, interesting that it came up not significant when the data set would say otherwise. So for our results of why they didn't report it, so now we know statistically they are not reporting it. So now here is like the why they don't report it. So anyone that had any type of sexual remarks or jokes to it, the majority of them didn't report it because they didn't think any action would be taken. So I have 96 participants that experienced this. 75% said that they wouldn't report it because they didn't think action was going to be taken for that. When it came to offensive comments on the bodies, um, the reason it was not reported was they did not think any action would take in place. And that was 69% of individuals said that was the reason for not reporting. So when people said crude or gross things, um, again, did not think any action would be taken. That was 67.60% of those individuals didn't think that any action would be taken. Um, when it came to email or text, we had 73.52% of those individuals that experienced that that didn't think um, any action would be taken and then continue to sexual talk sexual things. 62.5% um, did not think any action would be taken when it came to that particular sexual violence. When it came to sexually assaulted, um, it was a tie between embarrassed and did not think the action would be taken. Over 50% in each category thought that um, they didn't report it because of those reasons. So when it comes, we know that our LGBTQIA plus individuals are facing higher rates of sexual violence compared to the sexual and gender majority peers that they have. Um, we have a high prevalence of students that are not reporting this, even regardless due to the severity of the action. Um, and that was one of the limitations of our study is if you're having these comments made to you or something, you may not, uh, most likely probably won't, won't report comments to authorities, but if it came to actual physical harm, you're probably maybe more likely to report those. Um, so I show that their overall reason for people not participating or reporting these is that they didn't believe any action would be taken during uh, against their perpetrator. And survivors of sexual violence also reported that embarrassment was definitely another reason for them. And that could be due to social norms of masculinity and homonegativity in their environment. Um, and that obviously can lead to feelings of being rejected, bullied, teased, or harassed. 
Um, so this stu study also shows that the fear of being embarrassed and no action being taken against their aggressor has been um, in previous studies with victims and underreported because of embarrassment, fear of retaliation and not believing um, being believed due to your sexual or gender identity. So far, our conclusion with this is that research shows that, again, there's high prevalence. Regardless of the type, um, individuals do not report due to embarrassment or believing that no action is actually going to be taken place. Our survivors of sexual violence have all these negative health impacts due to this form of violence, such as depression, anxiety, negative mental health. Um, as our academic institutions and as health professionals, we should focus on making these efforts on these school environments to be safe and inclusive for our LGBTQ plus students and tailor our resources to their needs as well. Um, definitely collaborative efforts on campus um, with their students to make them feel comfortable reporting sexual violence and hopefully to reduce sexual violence overall in academia. All right. Thanks for listening.